All right, well, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. I don't see anyone else coming in. I want to welcome you today to our first ever symposium for the atypical Parkinsonisms. The University of Florida has been doing an annual patient symposium for uh, many years now for patients and families, and that occurs every year in April. So this year, that patient symposium for Parkinson's disease will occur about a month from now. So if there's anyone here in this room today who's been diagnosed with regular old Parkinson's, I think you'll learn some things today that will be useful and helpful, but we'll focus more on the atypical Parkinsonisms today, and then in a month, we'll have our annual symposium on Parkinson's disease. And part of what we'll talk about today is how those things are different. I do have some good news and some bad news for the symposium today. And the good news is that we are doing this effort so we can learn more about these diseases. But my co-leader, Dr. Nicholas McFarland, who some of you may know, is stuck in New York with the Nor'easter. So he, that's why you don't see him up here today. He was actually in New York to attend a professional conference on multiple system atrophy. That's one of the diseases we'll talk about today. Uh, and that was a very exciting event, and he got stuck. Uh, he tried to get out Thursday night, he tried to get out yesterday, and he is flying back this morning. But I will be presenting his talk. I'm one of the other physicians here that works with people with atypical Parkinson's. And I also have here what he sent me, the, top, the, the latest news about multiple system atrophy from the conference. So this arrived at 7.45 this morning, too late to get on the slides. Uh, but when I present those slides, I'll be able to give you the update that he got at the conference where he got stuck. Um, I do want to thank any of you out here who have sponsored this program. So, Activities like this at UF are often sponsored by individuals and families who give to our research program and our education program. So we are thankful for the people who make this possible. So what we're going to do today over the course of the morning is we're going to talk about the different atypical Parkinsonisms. You're going to hear from some members of our interdisciplinary team about how we approach these. And then we're going to conclude the morning portion by talking about treatment and also about kind of the cutting edge of research, where the research field is and where it's going. Then over lunch, we'll have an Ask the Team, uh, where you can ask uh, myself and then the members of the team that are here today your questions about the atypical uh, Parkinsonisms. And we do ask that, like Amanda said, you write out your questions on the sheets on the table, and then what we'll be doing is compiling those so that we can group questions that are similar and make sure that we try to address as many as we can during the lunch. There are also some tables in the back that have information about these different diseases. So if you need more information about your specific atypical Parkinsonism, there are two tables. There's information about dementia with Lewy bodies, about PSP, MSA, and CBD. There are two tables. There are also opportunities on those tables to sign up if you want to be notified if there are new research opportunities. And there are some handouts about currently available research opportunities. So there's one handout about interviews for people living with dementia with Lewy bodies, and another handout about an MRI study for people with PSP and MSA that we'll talk about a little bit later in that last uh, talk of the program. So what I'm going to do now is start with discussing the atypical Parkinsonism. So what does this term mean? What are these diseases? How do we recognize them? So I think a talk like this really has to start with the vocabulary. And you may have had this problem yourself when you've come to our clinic. I was told I have a, a Parkinsonism, what's that? Well, I want to start with the term neurodegeneration, because that's the broad category we're talking about here. And a neurodegeneration refers to a disease that causes a progressive death of brain cells. Now, there are lots of different neurodegenerations. Parkinson's is one, Alzheimer's is one, Huntington's, ALS. There are lots of different kinds. 
And what they have in common is that they're usually due to a protein that's building up in the wrong places. Now these aren't the kinds of proteins that you eat. These are proteins that are normal proteins in the brain. But for reasons we don't totally understand, the proteins are clumping, and when they clump, they cause those cells to die. And the kind of symptoms people have with these diseases depend on what protein clumps and where in the brain it clumps. So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, there are a couple proteins, one called tau and one called amyloid, and they clump partly in the hippocampus, and that's the part of the brain that controls memory. So if that protein is clumping there, you're going to have a memory problem. If a protein clumps in the basal ganglia, you're going to get a Parkinsonism. So when we talk about neurodegenerations, we classify them two different ways. We classify them by the symptoms, what kind of problems you're having, and today we're going to talk about the Parkinsonisms, and we clump them by the protein that's building up. That's what's causing the problem. But there are other terms as well, and I call these umbrella terms because they cover a lot of stuff. So the first umbrella term, and the one most important for our conversation today, is Parkinsonism. You've all heard this term, I'm guessing. And a Parkinsonism is simply a disease that has Parkinson's-like symptoms. So if you hear the term Parkinson's, that's all that that means. You have something that has Parkinson's-like symptoms. Well, there are lots of different Parkinsonisms or disease with Parkinson's-like symptoms. So the most common one is Parkinson's disease proper. But you can also have Parkinsonism from stroke. You can have medicine-related Parkinsonisms. There are some medicines, mostly those from psychiatry or used for nausea that can cause Parkinson's life symptoms. And then we have our second umbrella term. And that second umbrella term is why we're here today. And those are the atypical Parkinsonisms. And there are four main atypical Parkinsonisms. There are some rare ones, but we're focusing on the four main ones today. And those are dementia with Lewy bodies, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, and cortical basal degeneration. And so these atypical Parkinsonisms fall under that broader umbrella. Now, you may have had the experience when you came to clinic that at first, the doctor just said, Parkinsonism. Because sometimes, especially at a first visit, we can't tell. Sometimes it's too early. Sometimes we're not sure. And so when we're not sure, but we know that you have Parkinson's-like symptoms, you may get that label of Parkinsonism with the hope that will tease out the exact kind over time. Within the atypical Parkinsonisms, we come back to that idea of the abnormal proteins. So half of the atypical Parkinson's have to do with the abnormal protein alpha-synuclein, or abnormal clumping of alpha-synuclein, and half have to do with abnormal clumping of the protein tau, specifically for our tau. Now, under the synuclein heading here, we have two diseases, dementia with Lewy bodies and multiple system atrophy. And while it's not an atypical Parkinsonism, Parkinson's disease also fits under the synuclein category. So all of those diseases are from the same kind of protein causing a problem. Then the second one is the tauopathies, and there are others that fall into this category, but the two main ones are PSP and CBD. So there are some similarities in the atypical Parkinsonisms, and that's why you're all here today in one room, even though you may have some different diseases. So they all have Parkinson's-like symptoms. They're all Parkinsonisms. And then what I point out here at the bottom of this slide is that atypical Parkinsonisms are also called Parkinson's plus diseases. So you may have heard that term as well. And they're called Parkinson's plus diseases because you have the Parkinson's symptoms plus 
other stuff. And that other stuff is different between the different atypical Parkinsonisms and is part of how we tease them out. And that other stuff is part of what we're going to talk about in the coming slides. But that's why you may hear that Parkinson's plus terminology. All of these have gradual progression, but that gradual progression is faster than people with Parkinson's disease. And when we think about treating it right now, we don't have a cure for these diseases or a way to slow them down. So treatment is really about treating the symptoms using both medicine and non-medicine approaches and connecting people to research when they're interested in the research. And we're going to have a whole separate talk on where treatment and research are going. So when I see someone with a Parkinson's-like problem, the first thing I try to do is tease out, is this Parkinson's disease with or without some memory and thinking problems along with it, or is this something else? I didn't put some things on the slide like Parkinson's related to stroke or Parkinson's related to drugs, but that is in our mind too. And once we've made this initial distinction about whether we think it's regular Parkinson's or atypical Parkinson's, then we use that information about what, what's the plus, what's the other stuff, to help us decide which of these categories fit someone the best. So the first one I'm going to talk about specifically is dementia with Lewy bodies. So when we think about dementia with Lewy bodies, it's probably the one that is closest to Parkinson's disease. And in fact, when people die with dementia with Lewy bodies, if we look at their brains, we often can't tell by autopsy whether or not someone had Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies. So it's the one that's closest to Parkinson's. But what is different is that people with dementia with Lewy bodies have memory and thinking problems that are a big issue right up front. So dementia is another umbrella term. We have so many of them. And what dementia means is someone has a change in memory and thinking that is different from before. It's a decline. And it is severe enough to impact day-to-day -day life. So it's not that you're having a senior moment, but that it's really a big deal. You can't do things you used to be able to do because of your memory and thinking changes. And this, well, there are lots of different kinds of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia, but dementia with Lewy bodies is different. So where Alzheimer's usually affects people's memory, where they can't make new memories and they lose old memories, Dementia with Lewy bodies is more about difficulty paying attention, difficulty concentrating, visual spatial changes. So you're not quite sure where things are in space. You may have fender benders. You're just not quite seeing things correctly. Um, and then also difficulty with higher level functions. So multitasking, making complicated decisions are more challenging. In addition to those memory and thinking changes, people with DLB can have one or two or more of these core clinical features. So the first one is fluctuating attention or alertness. So one moment you're kind of like your old self, and the next moment you're really confused. Or you can have episodes where you kind of space out. The person with this disease is just sitting there staring and the family member has to try to get their attention. They're often called nobody's home episodes because it seems like for a minute nobody's there. People with DLB can have visual hallucinations, see people, animals. They can have REM sleep behavior disorder. That is a problem where people act out their dreams. So usually we're paralyzed when we dream. That's why if you've ever dreamed you're running and you feel like you can't run, it's because literally your body can't run because you're paralyzed during sleep. But people with REM sleep behavior disorder don't have that. And so if they dream that they're in a fight, they are going to be hitting in their sleep and can hit the person next to them. Or if they're bicycling, their legs might be bicycling in their dreams. This isn't specific to dementia with Lewy bodies. We're going to see in a minute that we see that in many of these diseases, but it's common. And then most people, or at least many people with DLB, have Parkinsonism. 
Now, if you're here with DLB, you probably do have the Parkinsonism because you're seeing a Parkinson's clinic, but you can have DLB without having Parkinson's symptoms. And then a little bit later, we're going to talk about scans, but there are a couple scans that are a part of these diagnostic criteria, and those are a DAT scan and a sleep study. This information is directly from the diagnostic criteria that were published in 2017. And you're going to hear that a couple of the atypical Parkinsonisms have new criteria published in 2017. This is a really a field that continues to advance. There are also some other features of dementia with Lewy bodies that we commonly see. So people with dementia with Lewy bodies can have severe reactions to, to antipsychotic agents. So those are medicines that might be used for hallucinations, but they can cause a bad reaction in people with this disease. They have postural instability and falls. They can have syncope, which is where you pass out. They have severe autonomic dysfunction. And autonomic dysfunction refers to a variety of different things our body does just to keep us moving and living. And when people have a problem with that, they can have constipation. Orthostatic hypotension is when your blood pressure drops when you stand up and urinary problems. They can have excessive daytime sleepiness. So some napping is not a problem, but this is sleeping a lot of the day. Poor sense of smell, other kinds of hallucinations. They hear things that aren't there or feel a touch that never happened. <laughs> delusions where someone believes something that's not true and you just can't change their mind, and then apathy, that's loss of interest, anxiety, and depression. And those are common with many of these diseases. So when someone has dementia with Lewy bodies, we do see this gradual progression that we talked about. And people often, when they have DLB, can die from DLB, which is different from what we usually see in regular old Parkinson's disease. And people with DLB, sometimes they just stop eating or drinking, or they have trouble swallowing or falls that cause the big problems. People live with all of these diseases for a really wide range of time. And in DLB, the research suggests that some people have a rapid form that progresses quickly over less than a year, and some people live with it for over 10 years, with kind of in the middle being three to four. But there's a lot of variability. The second of the diseases related to the synuclein building up is multiple system atrophy, or MSA. And there are two types. There's the MSA that has a lot of Parkinson's symptoms, so the MSAP type, and then the MSAC type where people have cerebellar symptoms, and that's where they have a lot of difficulty with coordination. So you may reach for something and miss, or you may have trouble walking in a way that's different than the Parkinson's. To meet criteria for MSA, and these are older criteria but still valid, someone has to have that autonomic dysfunction, so constipation, uh, the blood pressure drop when you stand up, urinary problems, erectile dysfunction, and then the movement problem, which is either the Parkinsonism or the balance and coordination problem. You can also have other features of MSA. So some other things that we commonly see MSA include dystonia, so that's when you have an abnormal posture, usually of your hands or your feet, abnormal speech. Lots of people with Parkinsonism have some kind of abnormal speech, and our speech therapist can help tease that out, but it's particularly common in MSA, especially a certain pattern. You can have jumpy reflexes, there can be a breathing issue called strider, which is of this harsh noise that can occur more at night. There's postural instability, where you have an increased likelihood of falls, especially in the first three years. Trouble swallowing, often in the first five years. People with MSA also have this acting out of dreams at night and can have anxiety and depression. So what to expect for MSA? Well, again, we see a lot of variability in how long people live with this disease. Um, 1 to 18 years is what's reported in the research. Average 6 to 10 years, but that's really an average. We have people on either side of that. 
And unlike Parkinson's disease, where people often don't need a wheelchair, that can happen in MSA. And often it's not from the Parkinson's problem, but from that blood pressure drop that happens when people stand up, such that you almost just can't stand because your blood pressure goes so low. And there is some research to say what would make us think that this could get worse a bit faster. And those red flags include things like being older when you get the MSA, so that's a mixed bag. You know, you've had more of your life without it, but now you got it and it's worse. Being a woman and having more of those autonomic or breathing problems. Now, I know this, the text on here is a little small, but that's okay because that's not really the point. But this is a slide that shows the synucleinopathies. The three main ones are Parkinson's disease, <coughs> dementia with Lewy bodies, and multiple system atrophy. And what I want you to see is that the main symptoms are present in all three. So all three have Parkinsonism, all three have autonomic problems, and all three have RBD where you act out your dreams. So it makes some sense that they're from the same underlying problem, they have a lot of overlap, but that also means that when you first see a doctor, it can be kind of tricky to figure out which of the three might be happening. There are some other features that overlap too. So people with Parkinson's and DLB can have tremor, though they don't have to. They may or may not be asymmetric, have symptoms worse on one side than another. They'll have some degree of cognitive impairment, though the dementia occurs earlier in DLB than Parkinson's. In DLB and MSA, they often have symmetric, so the same on both sides, Parkinsonism. They progress more rapidly than Parkinson's. Those autonomic problems occur earlier and are more severe, and the postural stability, instability and falls are more prominent earlier than in Parkinson's. So there are some things that separate these diseases. There are reasons that we consider them distinct, but they do have a lot of overlap. So going back to our, kind of our overview slide, we just talked about the synucleinopathies, and now what we're gonna move on is to the atypical Parkinson's that have the protein for our tau that's building up. So, when we think about PSP, if you read about PSP online especially, what you're going to be reading about most likely is classic PSP. Classic PSP is also called Richardson syndrome, named after the person who first described it. And with this classic PSP, people have something called a supranuclear gaze palsy. That's the medical term, but basically it means that you have trouble looking up and down. They have postural instability and falls in the first year of symptoms. They have Parkinsonism, and that Parkinsonism is sometimes worse in the trunk. So their, their trunk is stiffer than their arms and legs, and they can have slurred speech and trouble swallowing. Now, you may notice if you or a loved one has PSP, sometimes it gets to the point where you can't move your eyes up and down at all, but there are also intermediate forms where we can see it, even though you can't, before it gets that bad. And when PSP was first described, this is the way that it was described. So when you read about PSP online, often what you're reading about is this classic form of PSP. And you don't have to read all of this, but these reflect the new diagnostic criteria that were published again in 2017. So two of the four diseases we're talking about today have brand new diagnostic criteria. And what I wanna point out with this slide is that that PSP Richardson syndrome, that classic PSP is right here. And what I want you to notice is that PSP now includes seven other presentations and two that are so rare that they're not even shown on this slide. So we have one classic form of PSP and now we have nine variant forms of PSP. And that means we're gonna be more accurate in diagnosing because we're capturing all the different ways PSP can present 
But it also means that if you have one of these variant forms and you read about PSP online, you might not be reading about your kind of PSP. And it also means that we kind of have to step back as researchers and say, you know, they, all forms of PSP have the same problem in the brain, but they might not all look the same or act the same when we see them in real life. So I think this is a real advance. We're understanding more about how PSP works, but it's kind of an awkward stage as we learn more about how the different kinds of PSP act. Also right now, when we talk about research trials in the talk at the end, most of the research trials are still enrolling that classic kind of PSP. It's the most recognized, it's probably the most common form, and it's probably the easiest to recognize. If some of those new treatments work, they should work for all the forms, uh, but the, the patients being enrolled in those studies are still usually the classic form rather than the variant forms. And I talk a little bit about those eight most common PSP types here. So we have that PSP Richardson syndrome, that's the most common one, the classic, easily recognized, the eye movement problem with early falls. There's also a PSP form called ocular motor. That's when really the, the eye problem is the only thing. That's a little bit trickier because PSP isn't the only disease with eye movement problems, though it probably is the most common. PSP postural instability is when the main symptom is postural instability and falls. PSP Parkinsonism is a form of PSP that looks a lot like Parkinson's disease, and so this one is really tricky. So a lot of people with PSP Parkinsonism think they have Parkinson's at first, their doctors think they have Parkinson's at first, but then it's just not quite fitting over time. PSP frontal is when people present with prominent behavior changes and some thinking changes. Progressive free freezing of gait is when the first symptom is just a walking problem where your feet kind of get stuck to the floor and you can't move. PSP cortical basal syndrome is when the presentation is a lot like cortical basal disease. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then PSP speech and language disorder is when the big first symptom is problem finding the right word or getting the right words out. Now over time, if you have one of these, you can develop symptoms of the other categories too, but now we're recognizing that it's just not that one kind of PSP, but there are variants of PSP. And we think that those variants of PSP, what you're going to expect is going to be different. And that is because these variants are affecting different parts of the brain to different degrees. So that tau building up in some parts of the brain is going to be a bigger deal than if tau builds up in other parts of the brain. Now, I'm quoting here some recent research that started to look at how long people live with PSP, trying to tease out the different kinds. It's still not perfect. There's a lot we need to learn. But what that study suggested was that on average, people lived with PSP for about nine years. But there was a wide range from 2 to 28. So you can see that's pretty wide. That doesn't tell us a lot about what any given person should expect. The shortest or the worst PSP was that classic PSP, where the average was about 7 years with a range of 4 to 17. So still a really wide range even for that. And people with the PSP Parkinson type or the PSP progressive gate freezing type lived the longest. So the average was all the way at 13 years, but both, again, with wide ranges. The research to say what should we expect, when do we think people are going to get worse a bit faster, and that happens more if people have memory and thinking problems, early swallowing problems, and worse falls. And then some of this research is a little bit old, but the research that has looked at cause of death pneumonia from swallowing the wrong way is the biggest problem. I think I might have lost a battery here. All right, so let's go on to cortical basal syndrome. So you'll notice that earlier when I talked about cortical basal, I mentioned the term cortical basal degeneration. 
And that's the disease going on in the brain. Cortical basal syndrome is a group of symptoms that we see in someone who comes to the clinic. So cortical basal syndrome is this group of symptoms that go together, falling in two categories. The first category is the movement symptoms. So that includes the Parkinsonism, dystonia, that posturing that we talked about with MSA, and myoclonus, which is fast jerks. And then the second category is this other category where people can have apraxia, that's losing the ability to do a task that you used to be able to do. So you used to be able to brush your teeth and now your hand just doesn't quite know how to do it right. Or you used to be able to use scissors and now you have scissors and it's just not happening. Uh, a change in sensation, and this is a change in sensation that's a brain problem, not a nerve problem. So you may hold something in your hand and the nerve still tells the brain, but the brain doesn't know how to interpret that information anymore. Or alien limb phenomenon, it's pretty rare, but that would be where one of your hands does something that you're not telling it to do. So your hand grabs the other hand uh, and, and you're like, why, why is this happening? That's kind of classically described, but we don't see it too much in real life. This, this grouping of cortical basal syndrome can happen with different diseases. So it happens with the disease cortical basal degeneration, but it also happens with PSP. So some people that have this cluster of problems will actually have PSP if we look at their brains after they die. And some people with this cluster of symptoms will also have Alzheimer's disease. And then there are some other things that are less common. Those are the big three. So we use this term cortical basal syndrome because when it was first described, people thought cortical basal syndrome and cortical basal degeneration always went together. But now we know that's not quite true. So if you have this collection of symptoms, you most likely have cortical basal degeneration or PSP, but you could also have something like Alzheimer's disease, and we're trying to find ways to tweak that out. When we do think about cortical basal degeneration, that brain disease, we find something similar to what we just talked about in PSP. So people with cortical basal degeneration, the brain disease, can present with cortical basal syndrome, the Parkinsonism, but they can also present with a frontal behavioral syndrome. That's when the, the starting problem is memory and thinking, behavior changes. They can start with this problem where they can't get the right words out, or it can start with a problem that looks just like PSP. And so what we see, oh, I'll come back. What we see with PSP and cortical basal degeneration is very much what we saw with the pseudonucleinopathy category, is that if you have PSP symptoms, you probably have progressive supranuclear palsy, but you might have cortical basal degeneration. If you have cortical basal syndrome, you might have PSP in the brain or CBD. If you have the specific trouble getting the words out, you may have PSP or CBD. And if you have this specific kind of behavior change, you could have PSP, CBD, or another disease that we're not talking about today. And so again, we see that when you have the same protein symptoms overlap, and sometimes when people come to our clinic, we have trouble teasing out the two. We can never do it 100%, but sometimes we're more certain than others. So sometimes I'll see people and I'll even say, you have such a mishmash of these symptoms, I am sure that you have a problem with 4R tau in your brain, but I can't be entirely sure which one it is, because it's kind of a mishmash. It's easier to diagnose PSP than cortical basal degeneration, and so most of the research that's going on with the 4R tau diseases is going on in PSP. Because when you do a research study and you're trying to get rid of that tau that's building up, you want to make sure that you're enrolling people that have a problem with tau. 
Because if your problem is a towel, that isn't going to work, and that research study won't be telling us what we need to know. So the hope, and we'll talk about this in that last talk, is that if we learn how to treat PSP, we'll also learn how to treat CBD because the problem underneath is very similar. Now if I go back. So what to expect with CBS or CBD? There is not a lot of research on this, but from the research that we have, People live with CBD on average about seven years with a range of two to two and a half in this study. And the caveat that this is a lot less research than we've seen with some of the other diseases. And that if the problem starts with a memory or thinking issue, it might be a little bit shorter. There's no recent research on cause of death, but the research we have suggests that pneumonia is again the big problem. But this is a very under-researched area, in part because it's kind of tricky to diagnose. So how do we diagnose these diseases? Well, really, you seeing your doctor is the most important part. So most of these diagnoses are based on that clinical encounter. History, what you tell us. What are the problems that you've noticed? What are the problems that you're having? What are the plus symptoms that are present in your life? And exam, what do we see? What does that Parkinsonism look like? Do you have eye movement problems? You may find when you see our clinic, we're gonna check your blood pressure sitting down and your blood pressure standing up. Does it drop? So the history and exam are the two most important clues we have to figuring out what's going on. And sometimes that's just not the first assessment, but multiple assessments. So how are things changing over time? Uh, are you getting new symptoms over time? But those, that clinical encounter is really the most important thing for us still. If we need to do some other testing to tease it out, we can do things like memory and thinking testing. So that would tell us your strengths and weaknesses and thinking, and that pattern can be a clue. We can do something called a DAT scan if we're not sure if you really have Parkinson's symptoms or not. And I show an example of that on the screen. So this is a normal DAT scan here where you see the bright color looks kind of like a comma. This is an abnormal DAT scan here where it looks like little circles. So what this scan is looking at is the chemical dopamine binding in the brain. So here it's normal with the comma, and here it's not normal with the circles. This can be helpful or not. So the DAT scan is abnormal in all of the atypical Parkinsonisms. So it won't tell us if you have Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, or MSA, or PSP, or CBD. It just says you have something in that family. So we don't order this test too much because usually we know that just from examining you. If you have Parkinson's symptoms, you're probably gonna have an abnormal DAT scan because they go together. But if you have a memory and thinking problem that we think is DLB without a lot of Parkinson's signs on exam, this can be a clue. Or if you have one of those PSP variants where you're having eye movement problems and not much else yet, this might be a clue about what's coming. So it can play a role, but it doesn't tell us exactly what kind of problem you have. We're gonna talk about MRIs in just a minute. MRIs are often normal in these diseases, but they can have some clues to help us tease this out. An FDG PET is a special kind of brain scan that looks at how active different parts of the brain are. And sometimes in these diseases, they can tell us kind of that pattern can be a clue. And sleep studies can sometimes show if people have that acting out at dreams of night, which would point us more to that nuclein category of diseases. So when we think about the MRI of the brain, you'll notice here some changes. Now, like I said, MRIs can be normal. So you could get an MRI and it won't be a clue at all. 
But in Parkinson's, this part of the brain, so this is a cut kind of through the middle of your head, this looks pretty normal. In PSP, this is called the hummingbird sign because it has this narrow proboscis like a hummingbird might have. This part of the brain here is smaller in people with PSP. And in MSA, this bulge here is a little bit smaller than normal. Also in MSA, you can't see it really well here, but there, this part of the brain here is a little bit lighter and smaller. And then in MSA, you can also have something called the hot cross bun sign. So you see here, we're approaching Easter. And then you can see it here on the MRI. And there are also a couple other findings like this in PSP. You can have something called the morning glory sign. So if these are present, these can be helpful. Also in PSP, we can get out on our CDs and the MRI a little ruler and measure some things that can be helpful. So there are some things on MRI that would push your doctor in one direction or another direction, but your MRI could be normal, and that just means it's not a clue. It doesn't mean it's not PSP or MSA. It just means the MRI isn't helping. So we talked a little bit about this at the beginning. All of these atypical Parkinsonisms have some similarities. They all progress gradually. For the most part, it's not that you're going to have an overnight change at any point. But that progression for all of them is faster than you would see if this was regular old Parkinson's disease. We use Parkinson's medicine in all these diseases, and we'll talk about that more at the end, but they don't work as well. And some of them have more side effects than they would have in Parkinson's disease proper. For all of them, two of the biggest problems are swallowing and falls. And those are the things that really get us into trouble. And the current research that we'll talk about at the end of today is really trying to focus on the protein. We would love to have medications that help better with symptoms, but what we really want is to get to the root of the problem, the protein problem. So when we approach these diseases, we want to remember that while it's a patient, the person with the disease that's most impacted, these diseases really affect everyone. They affect the patient, the person with the disease, spouses, families, caregivers. They really have a, a huge impact on every part of life. In approaching them, we use a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary approach. And so you really need a lot of partners. It's the patient. It's the family. It's your local team, so your local primary care physician. PCPs are really important, even though this is a brain disease. Uh, the advanced practice providers, your local neurologist, the specialist here at Shands or elsewhere, the therapy team, physical, occupational, speech therapists, the social workers. Right now, we really emphasize treating what we can treat because we don't have a cure or a way to slow it down yet. So we focus on treating the symptoms that we have treatments for. We focus on quality of life. But then we participate in this research that's looking at getting at the root of the problem with the proteins.